we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Gonna pay for that or what? Excellent. Uh, real quick, uh, real quick, in the audience besides Marshall, uh, who was the actor in that scene? Anybody? What? Wrestler. What's his name? Uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper. The movie. The classic. Uh, Movie, They Live. They Live, all right, by John Carpenter. No, anyone? All right, it's a weird movie. It's, uh, it's interesting. But well, we just wanted to shock you a little bit with stuff. Uh, everybody relax. It's okay. It's like, oh, my gosh, what is he going to preach today? I, I didn't even, I left out the part of that clip that had aliens in it, okay, because I, I love you that much. But uh, good afternoon, Plano, Texas. How are you doing, Plano? Good. You're doing good. Uh, my name is Chris Fluid. I'm the lead pastor here at Redemption Church. And I greet you in the name of the Savior. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. Amen. We're in the third week of our Financial Peace Sermon Series. Week one, we talked about stewardship. That's to manage our money in a way that honors the one who gave us the money. We always need to remember that it is him that gives us everything, all right? We, could, we get in trouble if we think that we're earning things, all right? God gives us everything, and when we are good stewards, that's really good news. When we correctly are using his gifts and we are correctly following his commands, then everything we do becomes worship. All right. And that's a beautiful thing. That's week one. Week two, we talked about debt. The borrower is what? Slave, Slave to the who? The lender. the lender. Debt can enslave you. And sure enough, if you've ever been in debt and you get those phone calls and you get those nasty late notices and final notices and we're going to levy your property notices, foreclosure notices, you feel like a slave really quickly. Wow. Debt stands in the way of financial peace. All right. wow. It absolutely does. We gave you steps on how to become debt-free and challenge you to live on God's financial plan. Yes. Uh, God's financial plan is to be happy with less. And the world's financial plan is to never be happy until you have more. That's the world's, that's how they live. And we, we challenge you to live differently. Today, I want to talk to you about wealth. I want to talk to you about wealth. Uh, how were you raised to think about money? How were you raised to think about money? Think about that for a little bit. Uh, how you feel about the subject of money can have a lot to do with how you were raised. Were you raised in a home that never talked about money? If that's true, then uh, you don't want to talk about money. Uh, and it feels wrong or it feels weird and you can't wait to get out of this room right now. That, that, that has nothing to do with me, hopefully, right? Hopefully. Uh, that has to do with how we're raised. Uh, maybe you're raised in a, in a home that always pulled out a credit card for everything. They, they like had a holster for that thing. It was like, there it is credit card. And you couldn't wait then for your first credit card because you were raised in those conditions. How about this? You're raised in a home that struggled financially and you might be living paycheck to paycheck now and you think that's normal. You think that that, that is success. Maybe you were raised in a, a home that had huge fights over money. And maybe you were closed in a back room, but you could hear through the wall some yelling going on and you knew it was about money. And maybe because of that, you feel contentious about money. If someone brings it up, look out. The pressure in the room rises, your temperature rises, and your volume 
rises, whatever it is you are feeling while we are talking about money, uh, it should be connected, it could be connected to your past experiences. So that's something you need to, to look at. That's something you need to investigate. Know this going in. Because that's something in you you're going to have to overcome if you're ever going to hear anyone talk about money. Investigate these feelings. Some of our notions on money need to be confronted. Somebody needs to stand up and tell you, yeah, that's not right. No, that's not a correct way to look at things. Somebody has to do it. God elected me today, so I'm going to do that, okay? So don't hate me. Don't like go write nasty things on my Facebook wall, Marshall. Some of you might have wrong notions. Here's some example of wrong notions. Money is the root of all evil. Nope. No, that is an often misquoted verse. Probably you've heard it misquoted before. Uh, it's 1 Timothy 6.10. What does it say? For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Okay, so if you think money is evil then you certainly don't want to talk about money. And we shouldn't be talking about church. My gosh, we're talking about evil things. But no, the scripture absolutely doesn't say money is the root of all evil. Like, oh my gosh, keep that George Washington bill away from me. Keep him away right now. He's evil. No, the love of money is the root of all evil. How about this one? Poverty is more holy than being wealthy. Maybe you've never run into that. I've run into that before. That there's this pious righteousness, holiness over having less, over struggling. And here's the scripture they kind of use to buttress this idea. They use it incorrectly. Mark 10 and 25, it says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So they hold up that scripture right there and see, you know, if you're a rich man... It's going to be harder for you to get in the kingdom of God. It's going to be really bad for you. In fact, it's impossible because have you ever seen a needle? Have you ever seen the eye of a needle? You try to put a piece of thread. It's hard to put a piece of thread in there, much less a person, right? Have you ever heard the scripture used that way? That's a total misuse of that scripture. I will try to give you a quick untwisting of that scripture. Here it is. You have big cities in the, in the ancient world, and they had uh, any big, good city had walls, on the walls, you have gates because you have to have a way in and out past the walls. But at nighttime, at certain times when there were armies encamped and they were at war, they would keep those doors closed. At nighttime, they would close those gates because they didn't want enemies slipping in and taking the city. That makes sense? So they would close the gate and then they would have a small door off to the side of the gate. And this door was called the eye of of the needle. It was called the eye of the needle. And you would have to kind of stoop down to go through this gate. In fact, if a rich man came up and had a camel, he would have the camel loaded up with stuff. And in order to get the camel through the gate, he would have to unpack all of his stuff, all the things he thought was so important for this trip, all those things, he had to take those off the camel, and then the camel would have to get down on its knees and crawl through the eye of the needle. This is what Jesus is talking about. He's not saying it's impossible for somebody who's rich to come into the kingdom. He's saying that if you're ever going to get to this kingdom, you do have to set some things aside. Does this make sense? That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. All right. Wealth is attributed to pride and poverty to humility. That's one of the problems uh, with this, this wrong thinking. Wealth is attributed to pride, poverty to humility. But this is not necessarily true. Wealthy people can be humble servants. Yes, they can. Just because they have money doesn't mean they're all jerks, right? It's not the French Revolution around here. And impoverished people could be prideful, thankless people. It's possible, absolutely. It is not about what's in your bank account as much as it is about what is in your heart. That's what it is about. Uh, how about this one? We'll, we'll switch it onto the other side. The more money you have, the more holy, blessed, or loved by God you are. Some people have a misconception about that. This one's called prosperity 
doctrine, if you've ever heard that one talked about. So now we're, we've flipped the coin, and now if you don't have money, that probably means there's something wrong with you. If you are struggling financially, that probably means God isn't favorable to you and doesn't love you as much if you don't have the money. Well, let's look at Acts 3, 6. What happens in Acts 3, 6? Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have... I give you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Right here. What is Peter saying? Did Peter have silver or gold? No. 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 Was Peter blessed? Yeah. Did Peter have the anointing of God on him? Yeah. Was Peter far from God because he didn't have a coin in his pocket? No. Absolutely not. In fact, he had a lot more to give than silver and gold. That man got up, leaped right into the temple, and people knew about Jesus because of it. Money can be a blessing from God, but we are short-sighted if we see that is the highest form of blessing. If you think money is the highest form of blessing, you're really getting it wrong. God's love revealed through the cross is the highest revelation of love. Not Benjamin Franklin, Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm going to say that again until somebody's happy about it. The highest form of love is Jesus Christ on the cross, not Benjamin Franklin. Amen. All right. I mean, that's what it's about, y'all. Y'all aren't happy about that. No, it's true. What are you doing here today? We're at church. We're talking about Jesus. We shouldn't be talking about money at church. This could be a misconception. We should be talking about spiritual things. Don't talk about money. Talk about spiritual things things. The Bible talks about money about 800 times in your Bible. 800 times it talks about money. Jesus talked about money more than he did heaven and hell combined. He talked about more money more than anything else except the kingdom of God. He talks about the kingdom of God and then he talks about your treasure. He talks about money. 11 of 39 parables talk about money. Your heart and your treasure occupy the same place. He tells us that money is a spiritual topic. Let me tell you, don't go, don't go to that place that says, no, we can't talk about those certain things at church. Let me tell you, everything in life is a spiritual topic. And everything in life, we need to find a way to get Jesus Christ right in the center of that area of every area of our life. Amen. Amen. I'm glad you agree. Uh, so also this, Deuteronomy 8.18 tells us this. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce, say the word, wealth. wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to you, to your forefathers as it is today. It, he, it actually confirms his covenant. Does that sound pretty important? You bet it is. Is God's covenant important? Absolutely. The way that God provides for you, the way he gives you ability to produce wealth actually confirms the covenant. Does that sound like a spiritual topic? Oh, you bet it is. You bet it is. He is the God of more than enough. That's, that's our God. That's how he's described. He's the God of more than enough. It is not his will for us to live a life of not enough. I hope you believe that about our God. God has given us the ability to produce wealth. So I got to ask you, is that what you're producing? Are you producing that? Because he's given you the ability to do that. Sometimes we produce poverty. Sometimes we produce debt. Sometimes we produce bad things and, and stress. But he wants us to produce wealth. That's what he's given us. We dream about money sometimes. That you, admit it, right? We dream about money sometimes right? Yeah, you can admit that. It's all right. We dream about money sometimes, but our dreams always go like this. Here's the dream. We are suddenly rich and happy. This is a cool dream. We are suddenly rich and happy. Uh, that's the entire dream. Here's what no one ever dreams. No one ever has this dream about money. Okay. I'm picturing me working really hard, I'm working really hard, and over time, I, I earn a promotion on my job by proving myself and always showing up and working hard. At the same time, all the money I'm making, I'm making smart decisions with them. I'm not going crazy with my money, and I learn over time to tell myself, n -n 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 
No. I learned to tell myself no. And I, I buy used cars instead of the latest model. And, and I, I don't go out to eat every day. And I've learned the art of sack lunches. And I pay off all my debt. And then I, I start investing. And over time, slowly over the course of decades, I look at the life I've built and I find wealth. None of us daydream that way. We're like, poof, there's the money. No, our dreams about money are unrealistic Adam Sandler movie plots. I give you Mr. Deeds, everybody. That's the plot of Mr. Deeds, how we dream about money. That's it. Do not live your life according to Adam Sandler movies. You'll have to go back to school. Billy Madison, is that the movie? All right. Thank you. Some of y'all got it. Some of y'all, all right. Here is the plot if you don't know it. It's really, I don't want to spoil it for you, but silly things happen in this movie. Uh, long lost relative dies and leaves an inheritance. You have those dreams. Or you, you, you walk across the road and you see a lottery ticket and you pick it up and lo and behold, it's the, the, the lotto winner. Uh, we want to suddenly come into wealth without really working for it. But that's not what, Deuteronomy 8.18 tells us God gives us. He gives us ability. He gives us ability. That means you, you got to work for it. That means it's not a, this instant thing. That's not, it doesn't say I give you the miracle of instant wealth. All right? Uh, we want the riches without the learned responsibility. Here's what God really wants from me. He wants you to grow up. There's a place in your Bible that says that you should grow up into the stature of of Jesus Christ. You should grow up. God wants you to grow up. And in your finances, that's one place where a lot of people need to grow up. Some, there are a lot of other places. There are places in your relationship where you need to grow up. There are places in your, in your, in you, you keep having these terrible character flaws. You need to grow up in them. But in the area of money, absolutely, we need to grow up. For this reason, many people that come into a large Money. They come into large money, like winning, winning the lottery or even professional athletes. They end up with this immediate money income salary. A lot of these people end up blowing their money and ending up back in the same economic situation that they began in because they never learned the character. They never learned the responsibility. They never learned the ability it is not about the amount of money you have. Wealth is not a numbers game. Wealth is not a numbers game. When we think about money, we think about those numbers games. We have those lists of the richest people in the world. It's who, who's richest? Oh, my gosh. And it's, it's these number games. And we look across the cubicle and we say, do we make more money than them? Or do we make more money? We, do we have a better house than them? And we got all these numbers games. If you look at people and all you see is number signs, that's evil. That's the love of money. That's the love of money. That's the root of all evil. People do that, and they go and rob them. Absolutely. I had my car broken into the other night, and God worked a miracle. They went right past all the money we had in our car. We accidentally left money in our car, and they went all through that, that area. They went through everything, and they missed the bag of money that we had there. God is so good. I just wanted to tell you that. Absolutely. Absolutely. But people come into this, this large area of money, but they've never learned discipline. Wealth is not a numbers game. It is about your heart. That, that's what wealth is. That it's really about there. It's about wisdom. It's about character and it's self-control. You want to have wealth in your life? It's about wisdom. It's about character and it's about self-control. If you're watching this right now and you're not even a Christian and you don't know about all this Jesus stuff, you listen to this. Your finances could be changed drastically by developing character, by developing self-control and using wisdom. We ask God for wealth. We do that, right? And you're rightly so to do that. But why should he give us more if we haven't learned to manage what we already have? Okay? My four-year-old asked for a toy, right? But he's ripped up his last toy. Because he's ripped up his last toy and hasn't learned how to take care of his toy, I'm not that wild about getting him a new toy, that bring it home for you. Well, when God looks at our life and we're, 
we're spending more than we're making and we're actually, we're putting, we're buying fast food on a credit card for 19% and letting it ride for months at a time. We're paying 19% on our hot dog. When God looks at us and we're asking for money, he's like, Y'all are crazy. Y'all are out of control. What good would it do to bring you this money? I'll tell you what you really need. You really need to learn some self-control. You really need to learn some character. You really need to learn some wisdom. I want to tell you that God is pro-wealth. He's pro-wealth. He pours out blessing, and he gives us more than we deserve. He, he often does that. He does it all the time. He gives us so much more than we deserve. You see, his idea of wealth, though, is way different from our idea of wealth. Sarah and I love to play Neiman Marcus. Anybody ever play Neiman Marcus? You have no idea what that is. It's a, it's a fluid household tradition. Sometimes we play Nordstrom's. We're going to play a round of... Neiman Marcus, we, we, here's what we do. We go to some of Dallas's more elite malls. We usually don't fit in there at all with screaming children. Think like the Galleria or North Park, some, some really nice malls. And we go into one of the higher end stores and then try to guess how much they are selling some item in there. We'll just point over there and we're like, Ugly fuzzy slippers. How much do you think those are? And then we'll, we'll guess and then we'll go check them out. So we'll play a round of Neiman Marcus. All right. First up, we have yellow pants with odd black symbols. The pants don't go all the way down to the ground. If I wore this, I know I would get beaten up on the street. I know it. Those are men's pants. Those are men's pants, everyone. All right, so look at somebody near you and play the uh, Neiman Marcus game. How much are those pants? Come on, look around. What? $125. $180. Y'all are so close. Y'all, $755. All right, next. Valentino Windbreaker. This is a windbreaker. It's a camouflage pattern with pops of color. Do not actually try to use this as a camouflage windbreaker as the pops of color will give you away immediately. What is the first bid on the Valentino windbreaker? Come on. What is it? 600 800 $1. $1. <laughs> ba -da -ba -da. Come on down. Price is right. All right. Anyone else? Christy, come on. What is it? Here it is. 1,790 bucks. Sold. Sold. <laughs> All right, next. We have a t-shirt. A t-shirt. This is just a little undershirt that you can wear. It's nice. It felt silky. How much are we bidding for? What is this at Neiman Marcus t-shirt? $40. $40. That, that sounds crazy, right? $40 for a t-shirt. Keep going. 150 What are we looking at here? $1,000. Now we're just going, well, let's just go crazy. One million dollars. It's $290. $290. Last one. Speaking of things that would get me beaten up if I ever wore them, this is a men's butterfly jacket. Butterfly jacket. How much for the butterfly jacket, anyone? Free your life, your firstborn child, <laughs> an organ. You choose which organ. Come on, guess. 600. 2,000. 1,250. It is $2,590. Y'all should come with us sometime, play Neiman Marcus. It's really awkward when the workers come. May I help you? And we're like, um, how much is that? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the game always amazes us and it always makes us feel weird. It makes us feel just like, we have no idea what the value of a dollar is anymore. We are literally throwing out just funny money figures. It's like monopoly money. It's not real money anyway. Just throw it around. Just throw funny money at the name brand clothes. That's what it uh, feels like. A lot of our problems with money come from not understanding the value of a dollar. And guess what? The value of a dollar can change drastically with who you're hanging out with. Be careful who you're hanging out with. Some of us, we didn't have debt problems until we started hanging out with some people that didn't understand the value of the dollar. 
It's true. Good job, preacher. All right, thank you. All right. We either put too much emphasis on money or not enough. It's like we've got these two extremes. Either too much or not enough. Either we just fall head first into debt or we're like skin flints that hoard it and my precious and we, we hold on to everything. And this goes way beyond clothes. Clothes are not the enemy. It's not about clothes here. It extends way past that. It'll extend to luxury cars. It'll extend to your home. It'll extend to vacations. It'll extend to the latest tech. It'll extend to who cut your hair. It'll extend to who cut your dog's hair. It's crazy. Now stop, pause. Don't think I'm saying these things right here. I am not saying it is wrong to shop at high-end stores. I'm not telling you that it is wrong to own a luxury car. That's not, that's not the point. If you've got the money, if you have saved up, if you've built wealth, and that is what you want to do with your money, knock yourself out. Here is the problem, though. They do some research on this stuff, and the most of the people that shop at certain stores that are high-end like this shouldn't be financially. And the people that are well-off enough to actually shop at those stores, they don't stop at those, they don't shop at those stores, which is why they're financially well off. It's like this circular craziness thing. Get on the crazy train, bring your money. It's crazy. But I'm not saying it's wrong to shop at those stores. I'm not saying that Neiman Marcus is the devil. Facebook quote. All right. Pastor Fluid said, I'm not saying Neiman Marks is the devil, dot, 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 but, all right, I'm not saying you should not spend your money because God wants you to give all your money to the church. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, God has never said that. I'm adamant about that. God has, there's no place in the Bible that says, well, you need to give every bit of your money, every last dime of your money to the church. God has never asked for all your money. Here's what he asked for. He has asked for the priority of your heart. We've talked about that the last few weeks. That's what tithing is. Tithing is not about the amount. It's about the heart placement. It's about putting God first. God has asked for the priority of your heart, but even that was only 10%. He's not asking for 100%. In fact, if you tried to give Redemption Church money to the detriment of your family, we wouldn't take it. If you tried to give us money and you couldn't feed your kids, you better know you would have an angry pastor at your front door shoving that money and groceries in your hands. We don't do that. Don't put us in that situation. We don't do that. God doesn't want that. The Bible tells us very clearly that that is not good stewardship. You would not be blessed to give away all your money to the church to the detriment of your family. Don't think that for a moment. We have scripture on it. How about that? 1 Timothy 5 and 8. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever, okay? I, I wouldn't give it a second thought. In fact, someone, someone in this church gave us money Recently, and I asked them, is it okay for you to be giving this money? I wanted to make sure they were okay. I didn't know their financial picture, but what they were giving was so heartfelt and so generous. I, you have to, we care about that stuff. We care about your life. We don't see number signs. We're not after the love of money. We're after your heart. We love you here at Redemption Church. Is that all right? Is that all right? You want a church like that? That's who we are. I'm not saying that you only need to wear the cheapest, that you only need to eat the cheapest, that you need to drive the cheapest hunk of junk ever created. I'm not saying that. None of these things are things that I'm saying. I want you to get that. That would be a numbers game. Remember, wealth is not about a numbers game, but guess what? You could point it the other direction and make wealth about a low numbers game. It's not about a numbers game. That would be pointing the numbers game towards frugality. God is not about a numbers game. He looks on the condition 
of the heart. Your Bible tells you that. He tries to show you that over and over again. You have a widow's might. She throws in the widow's might. And Jesus proudly, loudly proclaims to everyone around, this woman gave more than all of you. And everybody said, you're crazy, Jesus. She only gave a mite. Did you see the amount that we gave? It's not about the amount. She gave priority to God. She gave her heart to God. And I proudly announced to everybody she gave more. That's what God's about. It's not, it's not a numbers game. Do you understand that? God is not about that numbers game. He looks on the heart. Here is what I'm saying. Let me make it very clear. We have lost the value of a dollar and no, under, no longer understand the purpose of building wealth. Those clothes up there, if that is your purpose for building wealth, your way off. You got to get the purpose for building wealth. He gave you the ability to create wealth. So Chris Fluitt, what is the purpose of wealth? Here it is. We build wealth to live in peace and to bless others. That is why we build wealth. It's simple. It's right in your scripture. We don't do it to impress others with what we own, but we do it to serve others with what we have. We don't do it to feel the pride, but to experience peace that all our needs are provided by God. We do that. God blessed Abraham and everyone that is seed of Abraham, any seed of Abraham in this place. Yeah, we're spiritual seed of Abraham. You should get your hand up. So those that come after Abraham, both physical and spiritual, are blessed. Here is why Abraham was blessed. Here it is, Genesis 12 and 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great. Here it is. And you will be a blessing. Why do we build wealth? So we have peace, that we know that God's calling us, that he's the one making us a great nation. Anything great about us, he has made us, but also he is causing us then to be a blessing. If you are wealthy but not a blessing to someone, you aren't really wealthy. You just got numbers. So guess what? If wherever you are, whatever that bottom line is, throw that out of the window right now. We're not thinking about that. What we're thinking about this is, do you have all your needs provided for? And do you have the peace that accompanies that? And are you willing to be a blessing to other people? I would call that pretty wealthy. I'd call that pretty wealthy indeed. So how do you produce wealth? I'm trying to truck right along here. How do you produce wealth? God gave us the ability. So how do we do it? How do we do it? Here it is. It's real simple. It's two very nasty words. You save. That's it. You don't have to take some crazy, complicated class on how to to create wealth. You save. Salvation is very important to Christianity. It's very important to every area of your life. You start saving. That's how you create wealth. You don't spend more than you make. You don't buy things on credit. If you can help it, you do not do it. If you can't buy it without credit, then maybe you shouldn't be buying it. Okay? You don't spend more than you make. You save. We talked about the 70% challenge, and we we told you that it would help you. Uh, If you could learn to live on 70% of what you earn, that would allow you to do some things. Number one, you would not fall headfirst into debt anymore because you aren't living close to your margin. You're not spending 100% of what you make. That's how people fall into debt. But also, it lets you do this. You could give 10%. There it is. There's a 30% hole right there. You could give God what he asked for, 10%. And you could use 10% to get out of debt. And guess what? If you threw 10% of your finances at debt, you could get out of debt. Yeah, you could. Or you could save for the future, that 10%. And we told you, actually, if you're in debt, hit your debt with 20%. Go ahead and take all 20% there and throw it at your debt. You can get out of debt, and it feels so good to be debt-free. No longer slave. No, totally good. It feels great. It's like, it's like you get a pay raise 
when you get out of debt because no longer is MasterCard, no longer is Visa, no longer is the car loan. It's like they're taking all your money. And when you don't have to give that money more, it's like, holy cow, I make this much money? Oh, yeah, I'm blessed. You were blessed the whole time. You were blessed the whole time. You just didn't know it. You were making poor decisions, and you, you, you didn't even have to make those decisions. Okay, all right. So honor God and giving, pay off debt, save for the future. Now, the day you pay off debt, your 70% challenge changes. Let's look what it looks like now. You no longer have to give 10% to debt. Now you could put 20% to save for your future. And you're still giving 10% to God. You're still giving God exactly what he wants. But here's what I really want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about saving for the future. That is how you build wealth. That's how you build wealth. You save for the future. As a culture, we are terrible about saving the future. We're terrible about it. Our idea of, of, of saving for the future is Doc Brown comes back and he says, Marty, your kids are in trouble. And you get in the DeLorean. That's our idea of saving for the future. Back to the future, anyone? I, t- I, I used that joke on someone the other day and like never saw it. And I just, I fell to the ground crying. How could you not see Back to the Future? Michael J. Fox, you're like, who? See that guy? All right. We're, as a culture, we're terrible at saving money, period. It might be that we're more worried about the urgent things than the important things. We talked about that the last time we talked, uh, th- this series we talked about that, that, that we, we are so focused on urgent things that we forget to do important things, right? Uh, and saving is one of those important things that doesn't always feel urgent. In fact, there's a real trick here because as you're paying, some of y'all are paying off your debt. Let me help y'all out a little bit because you feel this momentum as you're paying off debt. You're feeling momentum when you see that, that credit card go away and now you move on to the next one, you knock that one out and you're feeling all this momentum and you're like celebrating it every time and you get to that last one and it's like party time, it's so awesome. But you lose a little bit of that momentum if you don't feel the importance to save for your future. And this is where a lot of people actually stop in their, their quest to be, uh, have financial peace. They stop right here. Well, I'm no longer in debt. No, your future's coming. It might not feel urgent, but let me tell you, it's important. An, an August 2014 national poll by Bankrate has some shocking information about the number of Americans saving for retirement. Retirement? You, you can't depend on Social Security, right? Come on. You've got to save for retirement. You need to. It's good stewardship. It's got, you got to do it. You're going to make your kids pay, pay all your bills and take care of you. You've got to save for retirement. Here's, here's some of the stats. More than a third of adults have not started saving for retirement. Even Americans who are getting close to retirement age seem to be struggling when it comes to planning their financial future. The survey shows that more than a quarter of the respondents age 50 to 64 have yet to start saving for retirement. We're talking it's coming down the tracks like a a freight train, and they have not started. We've got a whole segment of society headed right for retirement with no retirement. And they're going to depend on the government. And it breaks my heart, but that's a terrible decision. Don't make that decision. Start today. Start today. Young people, start today. There's some of you, you hear retirement and you like turned off. Oh, that's way down the road. Start today. What if you started today? Everybody who's down the road in life says, man, I wish I were where you were and I was starting where you are standing right now. Am I right? I'm absolutely right. Everybody does that. I do that. I look at at, at little Robert Cortez. I look at him all the time. I go, man, I wish I were that old old and and starting over. How about this? 50%, 56% of couples have not even attempted to calculate how much money they will need for retirement. So we have more than 50%. They've not even calculated. What's strange is 47% feel really secure about retirement. That's like a a percentage. 47% feel really secure 
But of that 47, a lot of them have never even gotten down, gotten a calculator and said, what is it going to look like for us to retire? That's not good stewardship. It's not. Okay. Some of you thought the $2,500 butterfly jacket from Neiman Marcus was insane, right? Jeremy didn't. He really thought it was tight. But let me tell you, going into the future without a plan, that's what's insane. That's what's crazy. The God who gave you the ability to create wealth also gave you the ability to think. We got to think. We got to. You, you may get mad at me, but I'll risk it. Someone needs to shake us up. Somebody needs to tell us that we're marching straight into financial oblivion along with the rest of society. So I'll be the fall guy. Let me talk to you about the patriarchs of the Bible. The patriarchs of the Bible were wealthy. Job, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau, Joseph, all his brothers. Then they fell into slavery and all that was taken away. It was all just stolen from them and now they're slaves. But guess what God did? God restored them and Israel actually marched out of Egypt. I want you to watch what God does in this verse right here. Exodus 12, 36. These are slaves here. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. And it's telling us that they walked out of Egypt with gold. They walked out of Egypt with jewels. They walked out of Egypt not as slaves, but as a rich nation. God restored all that wealth that had been stolen from them. The patriarchs in the Bible were wealthy. David, Solomon, on and on. The people in your Bible, the people who followed God in your Bible, did not live in poverty. They lived in financial peace. Here's here's a scripture about financial peace. It's Psalm 37 and 25. I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. That's a promise for everybody that's a follower of Jesus. You shouldn't have to beg bread. You're not forsaken. You're a righteous heir of Abraham. You're a righteous heir through Jesus Christ. You are co-heirs, the Bible says, with Jesus Christ. And the people in your Bible who followed God, guess what else they did? They left an inheritance to their children. Much of the Old Testament, when it's talking about the patriarchs, it'd come time and it'd explain their death. A lar- it would devote chapters to how they would give inheritance to their children. They passed on wealth to those, to the next generation that was coming up. It was a big deal to pass on blessings. They would pass on houses and lands and wealth. Can I tell you, it is still a big deal. You ought to hand down something great to the next generation. Some of you have kids. You need to hand down something to your kids. Some of you don't have kids. Well, you have nephews. You have somebody somewhere you can hand something down to. The idea of an inheritance is a big idea in your Bible. In fact, the Holy Spirit is part of our inheritance. The Bible tells us it's a big deal. Salvation is part of in your, your heavenly inheritance. And on and on, God, the Bible talks about that. Here, let's look what Proverbs 13 and 22 says. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Not just for your kids, but your kids' kids. A good man does that. But a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. I want you to focus on the first part of that scripture. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. If you aren't saving, then those that come after you can't inherit your wealth. I think God wants them to. I think he does. Now, there are, of course, other things your kids can inherit. Absolutely. Uh. Faith, knowledge in Jesus, wisdom, your example, your love, a tradition. But don't you down deep also want to pass down wealth, pass down financial independence, 
financial peace and a knowledge and wisdom on how value of a dollar is. Don't you want to do that? You would be serving your kids pretty well if you did that. I think you should look into that. I believe God wants us to have wealth. And if you're struggling with this sermon today, you are the exact person that needs to hear it. I believe God wants you to have wealth. I believe God wants us to be good stewards with that wealth. I believe he wants us to impact future generations. There's places in the book of Acts where someone used their wealth and they sent it to other cities that were uh, in famine and fed other people. There, there's a person named Barnabas who sold property and he gave it to the work of God. He gave it to the church. What did he, what, he couldn't do that if he didn't have the wealth to begin with. He made good choices before he gave to God. Make good choices. Make good choices, Redemption Church. I know we've talked about money today, and it can feel awkward. It can feel tense. Some of you, quite frankly, I'm just kind of worried about you. Mark, just kidding. I'm just calling you out. But I still believe God wants to do something in this place. I know some people are like, well, God's not going to move today because we talked about money. No, that's not true at all. When we talk about heart issues, God moves. You just watch. We're going to be opening the altars for a time of prayer in just a moment. If you want someone to pray with you, all you have to do is come up in the first two feet. I'll make this deal for you. If you want prayer, you come up in the first two feet. If you don't come in the first two feet, nobody is going to bother you. We're not going to like uh, throw snakes at you or some weird uh, church thing. When Sarah first came to church, one of the first things she asked, she says, now do y'all throw snakes? True story. All right. We don't throw snakes. All right. No snakes ever in our church. Okay. All right. Amen. Someone said. Uh, But if you want prayer, no one's going to bother you. Uh, If if you don't want prayer, no one's going to bother you. You just come up. Uh, You don't even have to leave your seat, but we would encourage you to make a move towards God today. Um, I want you to remember that God gives us the ability to produce, say the word, wealth. I want you to repeat these words. God gives us the ability. Say it. Very good. In Matthew 17, I'm drawing to a close. Peter, the disciple, he was asked by tax collectors. Here's what they asked. Does your teacher, does Jesus pay the temple tax? They're about to hit them up for some temple tax money. Now, I want to tell you that this is ironic because residing inside Jesus Christ is the very present that, it, it, that inhabits the Holy of Holies inside the temple. Does God need to pay the temple tax? It's his house. Jesus tells exactly this uh, to Peter. He said, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? Do they collect it from their children or do they collect it from others? What he's hitting on is there is I'm, I'm, I'm the child of God. God resides in me. You don't tax the king and his family. That's what he's saying. And by the way, gra- grafted into that idea is that we are co-heirs with him. We are also the children of God. But Jesus says this, but so that we may not cause offense, it's never good to fight about money. It's not worth it to fight about money. That's what Jesus is saying. So not to cause offense, not to stand on a theological argument, but just to not cause problems. Go to the lake, throw out your line, Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and your tax, Peter. All right, before we come to this altar today, I want to tell you that God gives us the ability to produce wealth. He provides the wealth. He pours out blessing, but you have a part to play. You have to act. There's something you got to do. There is something you need to do today. And not just in the area of money, but wherever you are, whatever you're needing, this is how it always happens. There is what God does, and there is what you do. And you've got something you need to act on today. There is something each of us needs to do today. Peter needed to do something. Jesus told him to do some physical things. He told him to cast a line. He told him to take the first fish he caught 
and then take that fish, open its mouth, pull out the coin, pay the taxes. So we had a miracle from heaven, but there was something required of Peter. I want to tell you today that God does miracles, but that doesn't mean you don't have requirements. In fact, if you ever want to come in contact with the supernatural, you still have to do something in the natural. Who wants a supernatural miracle today? That's awesome. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to, number one, have faith. You're going to have to obey God. If God tells you to do something, you go do it. How many times does Jesus say, go, in the Bible it says, go cleanse, and the, the leper was cleansed. Go Go tell the priests, and he would give them commands. He would have them do. This is how it works. The miracle's coming. We have a Jesus that's more than enough, but still, he requires stuff from you. That's why we push you in worship. You know that? That's why we tell you to worship. That's why we do those three things, and we really challenge you to worship God. That is something you need to do. The supernatural God is here, but you need to meet him in the natural. And we receive the word of God. There is a supernatural miracle that can happen when you receive the word of God, but you've got to obey it. You've got to do something. You need to repent. You need to do something. And then in this altar today, I want to tell you that life-transforming things can happen when you pray to God. But they don't just happen. Somebody makes a move. Somebody changes their life. Somebody bows a need. Somebody says, God, I'm a sinner. Save me. Whatever it is that you need in this place today, this altar is open for you. you Thank you for joining us. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. And be sure to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter.